From WHEC-TV, this is a special report from Rochester's news team. Terry Anderson, free at last. A full report on the end of Anderson's captivity. Now, Janet Lomax and Gabe Delmuth. Last words to the kids. Goodbye. <laughs> With his sense of humor intact and obviously relishing his freedom, Batavia's Terry Anderson met the media and the world as a free man for the first time in more than six and a half years. Terry Anderson. Good evening. Anderson was delivered to U.S. authorities shortly after he's <laughs> spot in Germany right now. We have News Team 10 team coverage. You'll hear from Terry Anderson. We'll show you the joy in his hometown of Batavia and tell you about his final ride to freedom on this last day as a hostage. First, these were the first things he said during his news conference in Damascus. Oh, you can't imagine how glad I am to see you. I've thought about this, this moment for a long time. And now it's here. And I'm scared to death. I don't know what to say. I have, of course, to thank the Syrian, Lebanese, and Iranian governments for their cooperation and their work in helping to free so many hostages recently. I feel the deepest gratitude to Mr. Pico and the Secretary General. I don't know how to express it. I mean, uh, thanks just doesn't cover it. Your support, all my colleagues, journalists, has been very important. It, I've, I've, I've heard so many things over the years on the radio and in a few magazines and newspapers we've gotten about your work for me. And again, I just, just can't say how grateful I am. Also, the thousands and thousands of people whom I don't know, never met, don't know me, whom I know have been working and praying for us all, for all the hostages. Your support, your prayers were important. They made a big difference. They made a difference to us in some very dark times. My family, of course, my incredible sister, Peg, I will be thanking shortly myself and personally. This final day of Anderson's captivity was par for the course. Right to the end, there were questions. Will he be released? Won't he? This was the final ride for his family and the nation on that vicious emotional roller coaster. First, at 3.30 this morning, the high. Group reports Terry Anderson, the last and the longest held of the American hostages, was freed this morning by Lebanese kidnappers in Beirut. And then about eight this morning, the low. Why, why has there been a false start? No, not yet. Not yet. All of a sudden, those doubts began to appear. His captors, the Islamic Jihad, did release a videotape where Anderson was forced to read statements denouncing the U.S. and Israel. Then at 1.53 this afternoon, the emotional roller coaster finally coasted to a stop with the Associated Press, for whom Anderson worked as Beirut bureau chief, reported the following. A Syrian foreign ministry official now says Terry Anderson is free and is in Syrian hands. It appears bad weather held up the convoy carrying Anderson out of Beirut. As we said, Anderson is on his way to Wiesbaden, Germany now. I spoke with reporter Robin McIntosh, who was also in Wiesbaden, and we talked about how well Anderson looked and his sense of humor. That's right, and uh, his colleagues say that is the best sign of all. A sense of humor certainly uh, gives them encouragement, and uh, it's the first step in the, uh, the, road to, the road back. Robin, his sister Peggy Say is in Wiesbaden. As you know, she has worked tirelessly, relentlessly to uh, free her brother. Any reaction from her? Have you seen her? No, no one has seen her. She is now staying at the Amelia Earhart Hotel, which is just adjacent to the military hospital here. She is uh, staying uh, under wraps, so to speak, waiting for that moment when she can uh, see uh, Terry Anderson once again, put her arms around him and give him a hug, a welcome home. Robin, there are many American personnel there in Wiesbaden at that U.S. Uh, military base. 
Any kind of celebration plan for these hostages for Terry Anderson? Well, behind me here, you can see the uh, the Wiesbaden, uh, the military hospital here is all lit up. There are signs out front. They all say, welcome home to a particular hostage. The last hostage, uh, hostage to arrive here was Alan Steen. They've just taken down the welcome home Alan sign. They've replaced it with the welcome home Terry sign. And of course, this being the holiday season, the big sign out front says, happy, happy holidays, America. Any idea how long Terry Anderson will be there before he's able to set foot on American soil? Well, once the doctors take a look at him, if they give him a clean bill of health, obviously he could leave within a matter of days. For residents in Batavia, this is a day they have been waiting for. You bet. David Biggie was in Batavia when the community finally heard about Anderson's release. The word spread fast around Anderson's boyhood home. At this coffee shop, reaction ranged from pure delight to cautious optimism. I hope this is true now, because well, I don't know how much more we could take of this yes and no. <laughs> when that's over with, we should know more solid information by then, and then I'll call you back, okay? For months, Candy McConnell has been planning a big welcome home for Anderson. It's almost too much to believe that the day has finally arrived. We heard different reports that he wasn't exactly free yet, that he was going to be free. We don't know where we are now. With so many different reports, family and friends didn't know how to react at a morning news conference. Things changed, though, when a special report broke in, quoting Javier Perez de Cuellar, saying Anderson was finally free. American Terry Anderson is free. Now, that's the first confirmation from the Secretary General of the United Nations saying that Terry Anderson is indeed free. Now, there were several reports overnight about that. Uh, it's party time, folks. <laughs> I guess the Fres de Cuellar says it's true, it's true. Right. <laughs> I, I, and you I, can't believe him, who can I'm you believe? <laughs> That's right. No. Soon after, new yellow ribbons were added to the ones already on display. One Batavia High School put together a special mass, a time to say thank you for Anderson's release and a time to pray for his transition back into freedom. Reporting from Batavia, David Biggie, News Team 10. Stay tuned to News Team 10 for a special report on Anderson's release tonight at 7. Now, at that time, Laura Saxby will have a live interview with another freed hostage, Father Jenko. We have more coverage ahead of Terry Anderson's first day of freedom. Including a live report from Batavia. When we come back, we'll take a look ahead to the emotional challenge he could face back home. Well, I'm glad that he was released because he'd been in captiv captivity for so long. Well, I just got goosebumps all over and I'm really happy for him and his family and just everybody. It's wonderful to have him back. Beautiful time of year for him to be home with his family and I'm very happy for all of them. Terry Anderson, a free man now. What can he expect as he returns to normal life? Experts say, among other things, the likelihood of post-traumatic stress. Today at the VA hospital in Batavia, Korean War vets and a former POW wished Anderson well. They're still trying to deal with the trauma of the battlefield. 59-year-old Earl Nyer was a prisoner in another sense. He was among the Marines cut off at Chosan Reservoir. He survived and ended up serving a second tour in Korea. We're all held hostage by any act of terrorism or violence. And uh, there's different things that bring it back to mind and make it very real today. Doctors say you can never change the memories, but you can change the way your mind reacts to those memories. Sure. And some politicians are wondering if we shouldn't change the way we deal with some of the Mideast countries involved in Anderson's captivity and release. We spoke with Congresswoman Louise Slaughter earlier today. The idea of holding people like Terry almost seven years uh, really uh, was a, a deplorable thing that I think didn't work and really brought down the condemnation of the whole world on the, on the people who took him. Now, as we told you earlier, News Team 10 will be airing a special report on Anderson's release. That is from 7 to 7.30 tonight because of the uh, special uh, that we've just mentioned, our regularly scheduled Time to Care About Drugs town meeting has been postponed until December 18th.
Meteorologist Keith Eichner joins us with a look at the weather. Yes, well, winter is back with a vengeance, and we'll tell you all the details in terms of how many inches it'll snow in just a couple of minutes. Lisa of Terry Anderson. Tonight there are still prayers. This time they are prayers of thanks. There was a lot of celebrating and events planned for tonight. Church bells were ringing, ringing here at about 6 o'clock. We could hear them throughout the area. They were ringing throughout the county. An event is planned for here at the Salvation Army. A special church service will be held. People here are already getting ready, hanging in the yellow ribbons and getting ready for that. There will also be a party at 7 o'clock at the Engine House Restaurant. So the celebrating will go on here throughout the night, and I think people here will never forget this historical day in Batavia. Back to you, Gabe and Janet. Probably the celebration will go on for a long time, mm -hmm. I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. Wendy, thank you very much. Thanks, Wendy. We'll be right back. The country. And a reminder to join us tonight at 7 for News Team 10's special report on Anderson's freedom. Well, while you may not be able to travel to Batavia, you can still send good wishes to Terry Anderson and his Batavia hometown. A Welcome Home Terry card is on display at Arundaquoit Mall. Hundreds of people are expected to sign it, and then radio station WPXY will be sending it straight to the Anderson family. Once again, let's check in with Keith Eichner about our planner for tomorrow. I feel that way. There's a certain sense of joy that... Uh, really words cannot describe and uh, and what can you feel for Peggy say who has worked so hard to to see this day and as uh, she said uh, once her herself that uh, a lot of people were criticizing her in that uh, maybe her comments kept him in captivity longer than uh, mm -hmm. he should have perhaps but she said at least he is alive That's and right. today uh, today she is uh, getting the reward for all her efforts as mm -hmm. well we wish them all the best we'll see you at seven tonight folks good, good night, night. Good night. moment for a long time and now it's here and I'm scared to death this is NBC nightly news with Tom Brokaw reporting tonight from NBC news headquarters in New York good evening Terry Anderson a tough and resourceful former marine sergeant is free tonight after six years nine months as a hostage and he has not lost his reporter's instincts. The former Beirut bureau chief for the Associated Press was held longer than any other American, and he was the last to be released. NBC's Ed Rabel is in Damascus, Syria. Ed? Tom, we finally saw and heard from Terry Anderson following a roller coaster kind of day, full of promises that he was coming and doubts that he would ever get here. <laughs> The moment he appeared before the international press, he took control of the room, spotting old friends in the crowd. He sent up a chorus of appreciation for all those who had helped gain his freedom. Thanks just doesn't cover it. Your support, to all my colleagues, journalists, has been very important. It, I've, I've, I've heard so many things over the years on the radio and, and a few magazines and newspapers we've gotten about your work for me. And again, I just, just can't say how grateful I am. After 2,454 days in captivity, he described the very last day under the kidnapper's control. Uh, yesterday afternoon, my captors came in, brought some new clothes, uh, new shoes, my first in seven years, and they hurt my feet, by the way. Uh, and they said that I would be going home today. Uh, they asked me to read a statement from them to the world about this kidnapping episode. And... Uh, I did so, making very clear that it was their statement, not mine, uh, 
but I felt it was worthwhile to listen to what they have to say. I spent the night uh, awake, mostly. Uh, today, uh, I can't spent the day pacing the room and playing solitaire and waiting. I think this last 24 hours have been longer than the whole six and a half years. <laughs> he was Before. ever the reporter. I was never a Marine captain. I was a Marine staff sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud to have done that, by the way. And what kept him going? Uh, you, just, you just do what you have to do. You wake up every day and you summon up the energy from somewhere, even when you think you haven't got it and you get through the day. And what were his last words for his kidnappers? Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> then he was off to meet his daughter, six-year-old Salome, who was born while he was in captivity, a child he's never seen. She and her mother had come to Damascus for the reunion. Tom, the next stop for Terry Anderson is the American Military Hospital in Wiesbaden, Germany, for rest and medical checkups. Doctors are going to find someone who is very fit after almost seven years as a hostage. Tom? Thank you, Ed. For most Americans, of course, Terry Anderson was a pale figure in videotapes periodically released by his captors. But to his family and friends, he was so much more. One of his colleagues from the Beirut days was NBC's Tom Aspel, tonight awaiting Anderson's arrival in Germany. Tom, tell us about Terry Anderson, the man. Tom, he was a tough man, but he must have felt despair during those long years. I couldn't help thinking, how was he holding up? The first promising this, threatening that. I always wondered what went through his mind when they told him, look at the camera. This is for a message to the outside world. Who were they anyway? What kind of people keep a man locked up all those years, drag him out once in a while, take his picture, and then chain him up again? and the videotapes. And you could tell it tired and very lonely. They were somehow less chilling. It was much easier treating Terry Anderson as a story rather than someone I knew when I saw those tapes coming out of Beirut every now and then. He never seemed to try any cute tricks, like blinking out his location in Morse code with his eyelids or anything like that. He seemed to just sit there and read out what they told him to, like a reporter, come to think of it. These shots of him jogging along the seafront a month or so before he was kidnapped, we got him to do that as part of a story we were making about Americans living in Beirut despite the risks. You know what he said? I suppose you'll use them if I ever do get lifted, huh? Yeah, well, we did. More times than I can count now. We should all have sisters like Peggy say. We're begging you in the name of God to let us have Terry home with us again. She never gave up, never let anyone forget her brother and the other American hostages. They're going to be close for the rest of their lives because of what's happened. But this little girl's going to be the main lady in his life right now. His daughter, Salome, born a few months after he was kidnapped. She was brought up to expect him through the door at any moment. We used to videotape her a couple of times a year and send the tapes to Lebanese TV stations, hoping he'd be allowed to see what she looked like. It worked, apparently. Imagine, what a way to find out you've had a daughter waiting. Terry Anderson won't just be a picture for her anymore. He's going to be real. Terry Anderson won't stay quiet about the whole hostage saga. He's a reporter, and he's going to have questions, Tom. Thank you, Thomas. Amid today's joy, reminders of the brutality of life in captivity, two Germans remain held hostage, and of the other Americans just released, a doctor treating Alan Steen says that he suffered brain damage from being kicked in the head, causing numbness and seizures. And Joseph Sicipio, chained to an outdoor balcony in the winter, though well, he has permanent frostbite damage to his fingers and toes. When Nightly News continues in a moment, William Kennedy Smith and his accuser face to face in a Florida courtroom. And part three of our series, Pearl Harbor, 50 years later, Fred Francis tonight, with the anatomy of an attack that changed history. The doctor a cough, you have to keep up with the latest medicine for your family. Like new Robitussin cough drops, from the people whose cough medicine is recommended by more doctors and pharmacists. Try this, it's new. On WHEC-TV, this is a special report from Rochester's news team. Terry Anderson, free at last. A full report on the end of Anderson's captivity. Now, 
Janet Lomax and Gabe Delmuth. I spent the afternoon, interestingly enough, playing solitaire by candlelight and listening to the BBC reporting on my progress toward Damascus. Uh. <laughs> Imagine, after nearly seven years, Terry Anderson is free at last, and he still has a sense of humor. Good evening. It's hard to believe that Terry is no longer a hostage in Lebanon. And this is how Batavia is reacting. Church bells rang at six tonight to mark Anderson's freedom. We'll tell you about other festivities in a few minutes. But first, let's begin this special edition of News Team 10 by listening to the man himself. Can you tell us something more about your experience here in Oh, Lord. Uh, it would take a book. How do you feel about your That's title? That's an idea, by the way. How do you feel about your title of longest held hostage that... It's an honor I would gladly have given up a long time ago. Uh, what about I'm, the German hostages? You mentioned something about them. Did they mention anything about them? I wish I had some news about them. I don't. Uh, I hope for their release, as I hope for the release of all the Lebanese very, very soon. And I know with fine men like Mr. Pico and Mr. DeQuay are working on it, that there is a good chance that it will happen. I don't have any news. My captors have always denied having any control or information or uh, business to do with other hostages other than the ones that we knew about, the ones that were kept together uh, with me. What kept me going on? Well, my companions, I was lucky enough to have other people with me most of the time. My faith. Stubbornness, I guess. You just, you just do what you have to do. You wake up every day, and you summon up the energy from somewhere, even when you think you haven't got it, and you get through the day. And you do it, day after day after day. And it works. Did you tell yourself after you were alone, after you were the last one, what you did to occupy during the day? Oh, I paced back and forth. I had a couple of plastic bottles that I filled up with water and used as dumbbells. Played a lot of solitaire, had a deck of cards, and listened to the radio, mostly to the BBC. What were your last words to the kidnappers? Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Almost to the last minute, Anderson's captivity was a roller coaster ride of emotions for loved ones. After word he'd been freed, there were doubts because the Syrians hadn't been officially notified. There was a possibility of bad weather holding up the transfer, but as Terry Anderson himself said, he was still in a room, a captive, as reports went out that he had been freed. The release of Terry Anderson is having a major impact on the community of Batavia, Anderson's hometown. Wendy Wright is standing by live to tell us more about the celebration there. Wendy? hometown who would be quite touched and quite moved earlier as you heard there were church bells that rang here right now there is a special service being held at the Salvation Army songs like Amazing Grace are being sung all of the hostages are actually being commemorated at this event it seems like Batavia is a new place tonight it is quite different than it was before all of this happened for the past seven and a half years people here were reminded constantly of the hostage crisis of the hostage situation and now it seems that uh, people were, were hanging all their yellow ribbons. They saw on the front page of the newspaper every single day how many days he was held in captivity. And it was just a constant reminder of that. And now people are so upbeat, they're joyous, and it is quite an occasion here. I had the opportunity to watch some of the people here as they first saw Terry Anderson for the first time earlier. And it was an emotional moment. I was joined by Steve Hawley, a high school graduate friend of, of, of Mr. Anderson's. And uh, he was quite moved. He almost seemed like he was a bit in shock there for a little while. And uh, he said it, it, it meant an awful lot just to see his face. I think that people here, they've had their hopes dashed so many times in the past. And it was good to see finally his face in person. And they know that this long ordeal is finally over people here are also anxious to find out when he'll be coming back to this area. We don't know exactly when that would happen. We're not even sure when and if he'll be coming back to the United States. But uh, if that does happen, I'm sure he'll be welcomed back here with open arms.
You mentioned some of the reaction, Wendy, uh, from Mr. Hawley, people that know him. And, of course, you've gotten reaction from people who don't know him. Everybody is happy about this. I talked to some people who, who've never known him at all, and they just broke down into tears. And uh, they were just so upset about it, but in a good way they were upset about it. They, they almost thought for a time there that this day would never come, and now it finally has come, and it's been very emotional. It's also been quite a roller coaster ride for the people here. Earlier they heard that he was released, and then they heard that he wasn't. And so now when they finally saw him in person, that just told them for sure that he is finally released. Some of the folks you spoke with, uh, I'm sure they realized that Terry Anderson himself said that the prayers and well wishes helped him get through this ordeal. Uh, what do they think about that? Well, some of the people very close to Anderson and to the family have told me that they think it, it might have helped in the release. We don't know that for sure, but for whatever the reason is that he was released, people here are just happy about that. They say that um, they were constantly praying. Even when they started to have doubts, they were still praying that he would come back. So you never know, it might have made a difference. Wendy and Batavia, thank you very Thanks, much. Wendy. When we uh, continue our special edition of News Team 10, we will go live to Los Angeles. That is where Laura Saxby is standing by. I'm Laura Saxby, and coming up next, we'll talk we'll live with Father Lawrence Martin Jenko, another former hostage about the release of Terry Anderson. Most of the time to the BBC. <laughs> Your news coverage has always been superb. My special thanks to the Outlook team, Barbara Myers, John Tidmarsh, and John Waite, for the many times and the much effort they spent to bring me messages from my family and my friends, and often their voices. And that was very, very important. How will Terry Anderson hold up now after his captivity? Let's ask a man who was held with him. News Team 10's Laura Saxby joins us live via satellite from Los Angeles. Laura, you're with Father Lawrence Jenko. I am indeed, Janet and Gabe. Father Jenko spent two months as a hostage in Lebanon before Terry Anderson was abducted. And for 17 of Father Jenko's 19 months as a hostage, he was with Terry Anderson. Perhaps who better, Father Jenko, to ask for a reaction to, uh, to hearing Terry now? How does he sound? He sounds absolutely marvelous. I was so surprised, you know, he had such vibrancy and he's still bullish and he's, uh, so uh, it's a good sign for me to see how healthy he is. How would you say he's weathered this ordeal, just from the little bit you've seen and heard of him so far? Well, I would have to see a little closer up uh, time with him to find out what it's all about. Give him sacred space, let him do hugs and kisses with families and especially his wife and mother and um, of his child. and. There's so many things he needs to do and touch base with right now. Maybe we could follow up a little bit on that point. You've been through this yourself. It was a uh, little over five years ago that you were released from captivity in Lebanon. What kinds of things will uh, Terry have to go through at this point? One of the things Terry's going to have to do is realize that he uh, he's a, he's going to move away from uh, the sacred space for his. Uh, for his own personhood. He, he just can't keep saying yes to all the invitations. He's going to have to move away and kind of take care of Terry for a couple months, you know, find that sacred spot. Would you have anything that you remember back to the time of your release that you would particularly share with him as, as maybe to keep foremost in his mind? I would say, Terry, enjoy everything you possibly can. Perhaps you're not going to eat the food that's in front of you, but at least look at it, you know. I know that feeling, you know, you haven't seen it in a long time, but savor it and taste it and enjoy it and and lots of your dreams i hope they are realized now and because i know you dreamt about marvelous things and so i hope those dreams do come true for you but sometimes move away and find that holy spot for yourself terry said today after he was released that he's been looking forward to this moment for so long but now that it was here he was scared to death well, I can see why you're scared to death, because re you have different expectations, you know. For myself, m I, my expectation was simply go home to Joliet, Illinois. It didn't happen that way, and so his expectations perhaps are different than mine. But I know he wants to go home. That's the first thing he wants to do, touch base with loved ones, brothers, sisters, you know, his, his wife, his child. And uh, he has so many hugs yet to go through before he can kind of settle back and say, it's over with. Father Jenko, you spent 17 of your 19 months with Terry in captivity, and I spoke with you in the fall of 86 when you came home, and I know that you and Terry had shared a number of things. Is there anything that sticks out in your mind from your time together with him in Beirut? 
So many things. He used to complain about me being lazy because he gave me his watch, and every time I gave the watch back, it was always dead. And he said, you're the laziest priest I've ever met in my life, you know. And I said, yeah, and what am I supposed to be doing in a room six feet by 12 feet, you know. So, and then we, he did marvelous things to, ke to keep us busy and our minds active. Would you foresee at this point, and maybe this is a little early to ask this, but would you foresee some kind of reunion? Would you all get back together now that the American portion of the hostage ordeal is over? I sure hope so. I can allow this, you know, Terry to have the sacred space with his family, stand on the sidelines. But one day I will have to walk up and intervene and say, hey, I need a hug and I want a pinch. How about one last message if, uh, if Terry were able to hear you right now? What would you say to him? Terry, the last words I spoke to you were, goodbye, Terry. And the next words I want to speak to you are, welcome home, Terry. Father Lawrence Martin Jenko, thank you so much for being with us here in Los Angeles today. Thank you for inviting me. Father Jenko's home for the last four years has been here in Los Angeles. This is where he's assigned and he continues to be happy and healthy, he tells me. And we can only hope for the same thing for Terry Anderson. Well, thank you very much, Laura Saxby Live, along with Father Jenko. We appreciate uh, being with us. and. Uh some it's comforting terrific. words. Oh, it's terrific to hear him talk about Terry that way. Mm -hmm. uh. Laura, thank you very much. You're welcome. Now that all the American hostages have been released, what should the U.S. government do in response to those accused of taking those hostages? We asked some of you that question. Well, I should probably give him some sort of sentence or conviction because that's, they, I mean, they took him away from his family for six years and he has a daughter he's never seen. And, it's just not right. Uh, some political action must be taken because it isn't right to deprive a man of six years out of his life. Something's going to have to be done, I guess, to keep a tighter security so that this doesn't happen again. I think we should do it then what they do to us. That's about it. I think there should be some kind of penalty, you know, because that wasn't right. No man should be held up like that for no reason at all, you know. Most we spoke to agree they don't want the U.S. to do anything that would reignite the hostage taking again. You're watching a News Team 10 special report, one we've all waited nearly seven years to share with you. Terry Anderson, free at last. Coming up, we will hear more from Terry and we'll take you live to a prayer service in his hometown of Batavia. It's the Bundy's Guide to Good Neighbor Relations. And newspapers both because each year they brought a message to me from my family on my birthday, at Christmas, sometimes elsewhere. And they did this in the midst of their own terrible troubles. And that shows a depth of concern and support that, again, I just keep saying, I'm very grateful for. Terry Anderson is now on his way to Wiesbaden. That's where his sister Peggy Say is. And reporter Robin McIntosh. I spoke with McIntosh about Anderson's appearance and his sense of humor. That's right, and uh, his colleagues say that is the best sign of all. A sense of humor certainly uh, gives them encouragement, and uh, it's the first step in the, uh, the, road to, the road back. Robin, his sister Peggy Say is in Wiesbaden. As you know, she has worked tirelessly, relentlessly to uh, free her brother. Any reaction from her? Have you seen her? No, no one has seen her. She is now staying at the Amelia Earhart Hotel, which is just adjacent to the military hospital here. She is uh, staying uh, under wraps, so to speak, waiting for that moment when she can uh, see uh, Terry Anderson once again, put her arms around him and give him a hug, a welcome home. Robin, there are many American personnel there in Wiesbaden at that U.S. Uh, military base. Any kind of celebration plan for these hostages for Terry Anderson? Well, behind me here, you can see the uh, the Wiesbaden, uh, the military hospital here is all lit up. There are signs out front. They all say, welcome home to a particular hostage. The last hostage, uh, hostage to arrive here was Alan Steen. They've just taken down the welcome home Alan sign. They've replaced it with the welcome home Terry sign. And of course, this being the holiday season, the big sign out front says, happy, happy holidays, America. Any idea how long Terry Anderson will be there before he's able to set foot on American soil? Well, once the doctors take a look at him, if they give him a clean bill of health, obviously he could leave within a matter of days. Securing the release of Terry Anderson took hard work on many fronts. Louise Slaughter was one who tried to keep the issue before Congress. 
She's with News Team 10's Donna Didi live at the airport. Donna, we are all relieved at this good news. Oh, we certainly are. In fact, here at the airport, that's all everybody's talking about. You see the headlines on the newspapers that they're reading. Uh, Congresswoman Slaughter just uh, touched down from Washington, so we're happy to see you here, and you're a happy woman tonight, too. Oh, I'm delighted. I'm always glad to be home, but on this occasion, it makes it doubly nice, and I, I think that all of us are going to have a much better Christmas, and I look forward to a better New Year now that Terry's finally free. I'm certain that uh, you shared some of the nervousness with America this morning as they were watching. Uh, yes. Thought he was free. The Syrian foreign minister said, no, he wasn't. Uh, nervous time for you, too. Well, you know, for the first time, though, I knew it was going to happen. I and mean, we've been through this over the last six years of is he going to be, is he not? And, and now uh, to suddenly see him and see how good he looks and what a good sense of humor he has about it. Uh, I know he's going to have a difficult time in catching up, and it's going to take some while. Uh, to, to do that, but I think the, the reunion with his family and knowing, as he must know now, that most of the people in this country, if not the world, uh, really have longed for this day. You said you were able to watch part of his statement while he was in, uh, in Syria. Yes. Uh, what was your reaction? You think well, he looked pretty well? I, you know, I did. Uh, and I, I've been impressed with the fact that every hostage has come out, almost to a, a man, has said that Terry's good spirits and Terry's good humor made it possible for them to endure. Um, and I think he showed us that today. It was really grace under pressure uh, in every respect of the word. I thought it was, it was quite remarkable. And it did make me feel good to see that he looked healthy. Um, and I think obviously we'll have to wait to see as we, we have with some of the other hostages what lingering effects there are. Right. Now this is a happy time but of mm -hmm. course uh, what we always do is analyze things. We seem right. to do that best. Vice President Quayle today said that he thinks uh, the United States should take a look and seek to punish those who are responsible. Do you believe that there should be some type of retaliation by the U.S. government because of this? You know, I. I find that a very strange comment. He didn't uh, say where we were going to go in there with guns blazing, or is he volunteering to go on his own? Did he say? He didn't say. I guess we'll have to ask him that, too. At this point, I am very content that Terry uh, and all the other hostages are home now with the people who love them, or at least on their way home. Um, and, and I think, uh, obviously, no... Um, Without any question, the people who took him were wrong. I, my hope is that that kind of terrorism, that kind of cruelty, that we're not going to see any more of it with a changing world. Let's hope not. Let's hope. Congresswoman Louise Slaughter, thank you. I know it was a rush. Oh, nice to have you pleasure. here. It's great to see you. All right. So, Gabe and Janet, we've uh, been talking about him for six and a half years as hostage Terry Anderson, and it sure feels good to talk about him now as former hostage Terry Anderson. It sure does. Donna D.D., Congresswoman Louise Slaughter, thank you for joining us. Thank you both. Great. Still ahead, a look back at Terry's captivity. That when our special edition continues. Where Wendy Wright is standing by. Wendy. Well, Gabe and Janet, I think that if Terry Anderson could see what's been going on here in his hometown, he would be quite touched and he would probably be kind of amazed. Let's go back to this afternoon when some people in Batavia and everyone across the country were able to see his face for the first time. Now, this is Steve Hawley right here, a good friend of Terry Anderson's. He said that uh, he was it was hard to believe. He was uh, he was shocked and uh, it felt good. Finally, to see his longtime friend, his face for the first time, the place came to dead silence as people watched, and they were finally glad to see his face again for the first time. We will be going back over to the engine house where a party there is going on. It's beginning right now, and we will bring that to you and much more tonight at 11. Thank you, Wendy. All, All right, Wendy. Mm -hmm. It has been a nearly seven-year ordeal for Terry Anderson, but it is over now. He's free. Laura Saxby looks back at the events of his captivity. Terry Anderson once told a friend, if they want me, they'll come for me. Three gunmen did March 16, 1985. They pushed Terry into the back of this green Mercedes with a curtain around the back of it and sped off. That event introduced the world to Peggy Say. The 44-year-old left social work in Florida for Western New York, where she launched a campaign to free her brother. She asked the kidnappers for mercy in the first of many videotaped messages. Instead, more abductions. David Jacobson in May, Thomas Sutherland in June. TWA Flight 847 is hijacked over Greece and forced to Beirut. Say wants negotiations for the 39 people on board to include the hostages in Lebanon. They don't, and Say lashes out at then Vice President Bush. The word terrorist means striking terror into the hearts of people. Then Vice President Bush is certainly a terrorist. 
September brings freedom for Benjamin Weir. He brings news of Anderson. But no release, and Anderson marks his first birthday as a hostage. Beirut TV broadcasts greetings from home. 1986 comes with tragedy. Cancer claims Anderson's father, Glenn Sr., in February, and his brother, Glenn Jr., in June, four days after a deathbed flee to see Terry one more time. Please release him. Thank you. Reverend Lawrence Jenko goes free in July. Peggy Say meets him in Syria. But three more Americans soon lose their freedom. October, we hear from Anderson for the first time, hear frustration with his government. How long must we stay in captivity? A month later, Jacobson goes free. The next day, President Reagan admits weapons were sold to Iran, but denies an arms for hostages deal. Anglican Church envoy Terry Wade drops from sight in 1987, becoming one of the hostages he hoped to free. Three more Americans were kidnapped three days later. I love that you come to us. Come to us. The daughter Anderson has never met appears on Lebanese TV. It's her second birthday. Suleme is now six. U.S. Marine Lieutenant Colonel William Higgins is abducted in early 1988. He's killed the next year. No fewer than five photos of Anderson are released, each with a new threat. During Anderson's fifth year of captivity, a promise of help comes from Iran. Then Parliament Speaker Rafsan Jani says Iran will help free American hostages. The next year, the gates to freedom inch open. Americans Robert Polehill and Frank Reed come home. And this year, at the annual observance of Anderson's abduction, Say seems to sense the end is near. This is the last ceremony. And in a final videotaped message from Anderson, he said the captors would soon have very good news for the Western hostages. It was great news as the parade of captives went free, put the word former in front of the word hostage, and began the process of putting their lives back together. Laura Saxby, News Team 10. And we can sum up our special report with its title, Terry Anderson, Free at Last. We thank you for watching. We'll see you at 11. Good evening. Good night. At long last, a merciful end to a terrible ordeal. For too many years, we have seen their pictures. For too many years, we have heard the pleas of their loved ones. These men should be released immediately. And after years of waiting, the doors of their captivity began to open for one, and then another, and another. I've never felt so wonderful in all my life as I do now. And tonight, the last American to come out, Terry Anderson, free after 2,455 days. I've thought about this, this moment for a long time, and now it's here. From NBC News, the hostages, the ordeal ends. Here is Garrick Utley. Good evening. He wasn't the only hostage, of course, but he became the best known because he was held the longest and because he and we suspected all along, really, that he would be the last to be freed. And so today, Terry Anderson finally was. And tonight, tonight we want to relive that moment as he returned to our world. Find out why it happened now and ask the question, could it happen again? Let's begin in Damascus, Syria, as Terry Anderson, the Associated Press reporter, spoke freely for the first time in more than six years. <laughs> Oh, you can't imagine how glad I am to see you. I've thought about this, this moment for a long time. And now it's here. And I'm scared to death. Your support, your prayers were important. They made a big difference. They made a difference to us in some very dark times. My family, of course, my incredible sister, Peg, I will be thanking shortly myself and personally. Yesterday afternoon, my captors came in, brought some new clothes, uh, 
new shoes, my first in seven years, and they hurt my feet, by the way. Uh, and they said that I would be going home today. I've spent the night uh, awake, mostly. Uh, today, uh, I can spent the day pacing the room and playing solitaire and waiting. I think these last 24 hours have been longer than the whole six and a half years <laughs> beforehand. What kept me going on? Well, my companions, I was lucky enough to have other people with me most of the time. My faith, stubbornness, I guess. You just, you just do what you have to do. You wake up every day and you summon up the energy from somewhere even when you think you haven't got it, and you get through the day, and you do it, day after day after day, and it works. Yeah. What were your last words to the kidnappers? Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Terry Anderson, a sense of humor. In Damascus today, he met his six-year-old daughter who was born after he was taken hostage. He then flew with his daughter and her mother to Germany. He's expected there within a couple of hours. And our correspondent, Margaret Larson, is in Wiesbaden. Margaret, it's about 5.38 in the morning there, but there's going to be yet another emotional reunion, isn't there? Very much so, Garrick. In another hour or two, Terry Anderson is expected here. His sister, Peggy Say, who has championed his cause for so long and so vigorously, is awaiting him here in Wiesbaden. She'll be at the hospital when he arrives. Now, we know that he goes through medical checks, but what do we know, because a number of hostages have come out recently, what happens to these hostages and their emotions and their mind when they get to these spot? Well, there are a number of things. As we know, there's a medical evaluation, also a psychological evaluation when they reach the hospital, and debriefings from the State Department, as you mentioned. But more importantly, Wiesbaden represents kind of a decompression zone for the hostages, a chance to meld those two realities of being a hostage and then a free man. In this protected environment, they are able to take care of the kinds of stimulus that are coming forward and regain their personalities and their composure to go into the free world. And actually, it's about the busiest that hospital hospital in Wiesbaden has been. There are already two other hostages there, Alan Steen and Joseph Sicipio. What's going to happen to them now? When will they be coming home? It's unclear about Alan Steen's plans. He has some medical problems, but Joe Sicipio has been released from the hospital. He'll be going home a little bit later today. All right. Margaret Larson in Wiesbaden, thank you for being with us this evening. Well, um, Alan Steen and Joseph Sicipio, who are still there, both got some bad, grim medical news today. Steen, who arrived at the hospital last night, was told by his doctors he had permanent brain damage, the result of a vicious kick in the head while in captivity. Steen will have to take medication to control numbness and seizures. And Sicipio at the hospital today with his family was told his fingers and toes were damaged by frostbite and are now sensitive to temperatures below 50 degrees. Sicipio was chained to a Lebanese balcony one winter while in captivity. So well, you know, well now that all the American hostages are freed and out, there may be more disclosures coming out about what really happened during their captivity, stories that were not disclosed before for fear that they might jeopardize those still held. We want to talk now with two former hostages. Father Lawrence Jenko was held for a year and a half. He's in our Burbank, California newsroom tonight. And also the Reverend Benjamin Weir, who was held for a year and four months. He's at his home in San Anselmo, California. Uh, Benjamin Weir, let's start with you. Were there any incidents that happened to you that you were reluctant to talk about up now there was one that I didn't speak about during the first months I was released though on the whole my treatment was good but on one occasion I tried to look out of a window when I thought the captors had left the building I pulled back the uh, the plastic that was stuck to the window opened the window and tried to yell to two men in the distance for help but uh, that was enough to awaken the guard who was asleep in the adjoining room he came in like a bull in a china shop and began to kick and, uh, and beat me and said he was going to break my bones, but to my surprise really didn't give me any serious bruises. Uh, later I was chained up for, into a somewhat crouched position for uh, two or three days and, and the thing passed off. But Father, that was the worst. Father that Jen was the worst. Mostly I was uh, treated pretty well. Father Jenkel, let's go to you right now. You had harsh treatment. Do you think that this is a pattern that every hostage can attest to? This was standard operating procedure by the kidnappers? I don't think so. I, it, it would depend upon the persons. I suppose my great tortures were being taped like a mummy and slid beneath a truck and moved from place to place. 
And it's marvelous to see that these men are being moved to Damascus, not through that same torturous route that I had to go through, you know, taped beneath the truck, arms to the side, cloth in the mouth, and blindfolded until you arrive there. It's a frightening experience, and they did that to me three times. When Ben was relating his incident, I was in the cubicle next to Ben, and I once again we somewhat relived what Ben was all about and that horrendous night that happened, or morning that happened. Well, let me ask both of you gentlemen, because of these experiences that you're, you're telling us right now, one of the conditions the kidnappers apparently wanted, or assurances they wanted, was that no, no government would take up reprisals against them once all the hostages were released. How should we react to that? How do you react to it? Father Jenko first. When I first wrote to my family, I wrote to them, if the American government were to intervene on my behalf, I would, I would be hanged. And I told, Ben told me that in, their, uh, in English, because Hodge was telling that to Ben. And I thought, oh, I prefer being shot. But they're very serious about that. There's noise outside of a, a room that you're in, and you're immediately against the wall with a machine gun to your head. So they're quite serious about that. So I would say, please don't do anything allow the time to take place but, for men to be set free. But, but uh, Reverend Weir, now that all the American hostages have been set free, Terry Anderson being the last to come out, what should our attitude be towards those who were your kidnappers and his kidnappers? I think we have to remember that the guards that uh, were responsible for me and for others apparently were not the decision makers. And I don't think there's anything to be gained by trying to retaliate against them. I think rather it's far more important that we should engage in policies to try to bring stability and uh, some measure of uh, improving understanding in the Middle East in order to break the cycle of violence. We certainly don't want to encourage greater extremism and therefore we've got to support moderatism. And Father Jenko, do you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that, and I would, uh, would hope that we would not have an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth policy, because in that kind of a situation, we go back to almost to the original instance of Cain killing Abel. We keep pointing fingers, and where do the pointing of fingers end? You know, we might point them to those who kidnapped me, but others will point to others. Right. And it just is a vicious circle which we should stop now. All right. Thank you very much, Father Jenko and Reverend Weir, for being with us this evening from California. And amid the joy of Terry Anderson's release tonight, we should remember three who were not so fortunate and will not be coming home. Lieutenant Colonel William Higgins, on assignment with UN forces in southern Lebanon, was executed by his kidnappers. The same fate ended the life of William Buckley, the CIA station chief in Beirut. And Peter Kilburn, a librarian, was also murdered by his captors, along with two British hostages following the American bombing raid against Libya. For those who lived, their ordeal is now over. Why did it end now, and could it happen again? We'll get some answers next. And finally unchained the hostages publicly. The Bush administration of Washington refused to negotiate with the kidnappers. Privately, well, privately, nods, winks, secret bargaining, and intermediaries eventually led to what might be called a no-deal deal, or at least understanding. For example, just this week, the United States released $278 million in frozen assets to Iran, money impounded since 1979. Israel became a pivotal player in the whole affair, releasing 91 Arab prisoners in exchange for information about missing Israeli servicemen. In the end, the hostage takers weren't even demanding the release of 200 other Shiite militants still in Israeli hands in exchange for the Americans. But why, why did it happen now, today? Well, the world changed, and so did the Middle East. Our chief diplomatic correspondent, John Dancy, is in Washington tonight. Good evening, John. Good evening, Garrick. Terry Anderson was a prisoner of time. He was kidnapped because of the times, and ultimately, he was freed because of the times. The mid-80s, civil war in Lebanon. A bombing that killed 241 American Marines in Beirut. American after American taken hostage. That outraged U.S. citizens. But when the Reagan administration reacted, that seemed only to whet the appetite of the terrorists. Once they realized the impact it had upon us, uh, that made them all the more eager to use this approach. The U.S. secretly offered Iran missiles for the hostages, violating rules for dealing with terrorists drafted by President Reagan's own team of experts. Former Ambassador Robert Oakley was the State Department's expert on counterterrorism at the time. Reagan wasn't practicing what he preached, if you will, in this report, and uh, Bush did. Uh, uh, don't respond, uh, much less publicity. Uh, rely upon the rule of law more than uh, sort of cowboy adventures. Uh, be calm about it and uh, be consistent. 
This year, the Persian Gulf War changed everything. The Soviet Union joined the U.S. in opposing Saddam Hussein. The effect was to leave the U.S. as the dominant power in the Mideast. That fact did not go unnoticed in either Syria or Iran. Syria became an active partner in Secretary of State Baker's search for a Middle East peace conference. Iran quickly dropped its support for hostage takers. The change in the Iranian and the Syrian attitudes and their perceptions of where their interest lies have greatly contributed to the resolution of problems. A Syrian delegation is in Washington today, ready to meet with Israel to talk about Middle East peace. That's something unheard of a few months ago. As for the Iranian, President Bush held out an olive branch to them as long ago as his inaugural address. Assistance can be shown here and will be long remembered. Goodwill begets goodwill. Ambassador Robert Oakley sees opportunity in the end of the hostage drama. Well, I think we moved this story forward by thinking less about terrorism and uh, more about uh, dealing with the problems uh, out of which terrorism comes and trying to develop decent relationships with governments that can keep the terrorists in check. So an era may have ended today, ended because the conditions that gave it life have changed, and in that there is hope. Garrick? All right, thanks, John Dancy in Washington. Well, how much hope could hostages be taken and once again in the Middle East? With us now with some answers is Dr. Henry Kissinger, who is in Chicago tonight. Good evening, doctor. Could you, Good evening. Could you um, give us some help here? Does this release of Terry Anderson, as well as all the other hostages, mean that it won't happen again? No, I wouldn't say it, does. it, it doesn't mean that it couldn't happen again. I don't think it can happen in the next few years, as long as the conditions that now obtain will continue. Those conditions are that Iran wants help from the West for its economic reconstruction, that Syria is in no position to challenge the West as long as the Soviet Union is weak, uh, and so long as the United States on the basis of its Gulf victory looks like the dominant country in the area. What? As long as all of these conditions remain in place, I don't think there will be any more hostage taking. Well, let's follow up on this. You say, quote, as long as, take uh, Iran first. Pre President Rafsanjani wants to get back into the world community and do business with us, but can that be, is that something that can be trusted? Is there stability there? Uh, not, uh, well, there is a temporary stability, but I think in the long run, Iran is, uh, wants the domination of that area, and if, one of the motives of taking American hostages, which was to demonstrate American impotence, uh, if, if that incentive should again re-emerge, I think they're quite capable of doing it. On the other hand, one can hope that if the process of economic reconstruction develops for a while, that the incentive to conduct that sort of uh, domineering policy will disappear. Now, Dr. Kissinger, every hostage who has been freed has thanked the Syrian government for its help in the release. We've seen that many times on television. And yet, the United States still officially classifies Syria as a nation supporting terrorism. Now, is this hypocrisy or is it really smart diplomacy? I think it's essentially correct. Uh, I can understand that the hostages would thank the Syrians because, after all, they were freed in Syria. And I'm sure also that Syria has undertaken efforts to release them. But we ought to be careful not to reward countries for having stopped doing something they should never have done in the first place, uh, especially so long as at least six or seven terrorist organizations retain their headquarters in Damascus. Uh, so I, I think one should take it easy about giving Syria too much credit. Finally, the impact of this in the Middle East Peace Conference, which resumed in Washington today, albeit absent the Israeli delegation, which will come in a few days to Washington. <clears throat> will the release of the hostages, Terry Anderson, help that peace process in any significant way? I don't, I don't think it's directly related, because Iran undoubtedly played a role in the release of the hostages and it is opposed to the peace process. But I think the same conditions that produced the release of the hostages are also involved in the peace process. That is to say that Syria wants to move more towards the United States since the Soviet Union is not capable of playing a major role in the area. Uh, the radical Arabs in the various countries are also discouraged by the decline of any uh, outside influence. And all of this has given the moderates an opportunity to make progress on, on the peace front. So I think the conditions that produce the release of the hostages 
are also involved in the peace process, even though these are two separate events. All right, Dr. Henry Kissinger, thank you for being with us this evening from Chicago. We'll see how that process in Washington and elsewhere continues. Next, what Terry Anderson missed, six years that changed the world. He's coming back to I was a dedicated beard wearer until my wife gave me the new Remington Microscreen Elite. It's quick. It's close. The Remington Microscreen Elite has two ultra-thin screens and 112 diamond hone cutting edges. The first screen shaves incredibly close. The second even closer. The Remington Microscreen Elite, so comfortable, shaves as close as a blade or your money back. And the Lady Remington, the perfect gift. Shave wet or dry. Super value shavers from Remington. No, you go ahead, honey. My throat really hurts. When your throat is sore and it's feeling raw, try Sucrets. Sucrets wraps your throat in soothing relief. Much better. Only Sucrets has the medicine diclinine to soothe minor sore throat pain for long-lasting relief. How about a bite to eat? Oh, not with this sore throat. When your throat's in pain, feel better again. Try Sucrets and wrap your throat in soothing relief. That does feel better. Sucrets wraps your throat in soothing relief. And finally this evening, how long was Terry Anderson held hostage in Lebanon? Of course, we and he can measure it in days or in years. And it can also be measured in how the world has changed. Example, Anderson was kidnapped the same week that Mikhail Gorbachev came to power in the Soviet Union. Seemed like a long time ago. It was. Here's Mike Betcher. A few faded photographs and some fuzzy videotape was all we saw of him during six years, eight months, and 18 days. He saw nothing of us. His clock stood still while the world kept running. He didn't hear in 1985 his sister's despair. We're panic-stricken at this point. We don't know what to do. But the world kept changing. But they are beating the passengers. They are threatening to kill them now. ask why, and you don't find any answer. He didn't know in 1986 that his father and brother were dying. My father died of cancer waiting to see Terry. But the world kept changing. It's the price of nuclear energy. There they are, the crew of Mission 51L. In 1987, he couldn't witness the hostage memorial service, but the world kept changing. I will tell you right now, counsel, that I misled the Congress. What we have achieved here means hope. He didn't hear in 1988 people singing for his release, but the world kept changing. Read my lips. Punish firmly, decisively, those who did this. Happy birthday to And in 1989, he couldn't witness his own daughter's song. Happy birthday to you. But the world kept changing. I've been in the Bay Area for about 20 years. I've never seen anything like this. Ariega is a very uh, skilled thug. We have to go back in. He couldn't have seen in 1990 the joy on the faces of fellow hostages who were released. But the world kept changing. Saddam is making the mistake of his life. And in 1991, he missed the Persian Gulf War and the disintegration of the Soviet Empire. But today, because the world kept changing all those years, time began running once more for Terry Anderson. Mike Betcher, NBC News, New York. Watch the wire. Watch the wire. You look at Terry Anderson there, you look at that scene in Damascus, and perhaps you ask yourself the question, how do you put a value on time? How does Terry Anderson measure the time lost, the years separated from family, from friends, from the sun, and from that thing we take for granted called freedom? Like the other hostages, he will have to reconcile himself to what has been lost. But from what we saw of him today, it appears that he has the strength to handle it, a strength called humor. Asked how he felt having been the longest held hostage in Lebanon, he replied with a laugh, quote, It's an honor I would gladly have given up a long time ago. And tonight, he finally could. I'm Garrick Utley. Good night for all of us at NBC News. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Watch the wires. Watch the wires. Hey, well, we'll see you. Watch the first wires. Hey, 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 Reasonable Doubts on a special night, NBC Thursday. His sister Peggy Say, who did something she's waited a long time to do. And now I'm going to do the thing that I've waited almost seven years to do. I'd like to introduce you to my brother, Terry Anderson. I didn't expect this. I was all cool and calm and ready to go. And thinking about all the neat things I was going to say. And they all just kind of disappeared. There were some pretty bad times. And uh, there were times when I was near despair. <laughs> Don't think I ever quite gave up. Uh, thankfully, the first book I got a few months after I got there was the Bible, and that helped. And at the beginning, uh, when it was pretty shocking, I mean, frankly, I wouldn't care if he'd have given him an H-bomb just to get me out of that damn place. I think President Bush is absolutely right. I think the United States, in the end, after some time, took the right policy in not negotiating with my captors. I'm out. I'm free. I do not hate them. I'm certainly not grateful to them for anything. Uh, I believe they were very wrong, and they did great wrong to me and my family. First, when I leave here, I'm going to spend a little time with my family, my brothers and sisters. Uh, and then I'm going to take some months off. And, and we're making plans about that, but we haven't quite decided it. Can you look out at those cameras and say something to the people of Western New York? Yes. Yes, I would be there now if it weren't wintertime and so darn cold, I think. <laughs> Look, those weren't wasted years, okay? And they weren't empty. I lived through them. I learned some things from them. And I'll use them, I hope. He looks and sounds great. Absolutely. We asked our man in Wiesbaden, Terry Sater, to describe the atmosphere during that news conference. It was an incredible news conference, I thought. You know, Terry Anderson said he came to the press conference with a prepared speech, but it was clear that uh, he was just uh, overcome by a wave of emotion, and, and you can see that in the videotape that we've been showing throughout the day. We heard uh, Peggy say, mention that Terry Anderson had changed. Did she ever elaborate on how he had changed? Well, what she said is that um, he was a different Terry, but that he was a Terry that she liked even more. And uh, she said that through the years of the pain and, and, and anger and frustration, that they both had been tempered by the fire. Now, you say you mentioned that Terry planned a, quote, drinking party tonight with old friends. Do you know anything about that or anything about anything else that Terry is doing the next few hours and days? I don't know about his party tonight, but he did say that uh, last night he was given a very nice bottle of wine that he enjoyed uh, thoroughly. Uh, I talked with uh, some of the Steen family members uh, last night, and uh, they had been partying, and certainly a lot of celebrating going on, and I guess, I guess we'd expect that. He said that he is enjoying his time here, and he said he needs a few more days here in Germany before he uh, is greeted by uh, what's going to be another throng of reporters when he comes back to the United States. That's for sure. Terry Sater and V-Spot in Germany. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Of course, the whole world watched Terry Anderson's news conference this morning. Residents of Batavia watched with special interest and concern. David Biggie was there with a woman who has waited years to see this day. Candy McConnell has been working tirelessly to see this day. Now it is finally here. Uh, he's got a Buffalo Bill shirt on. Boy, do you think that'll get him to dedicate the game? Yeah! Oh, definitely looked marvelous. McConnell, like Mo, showed a range of emotions during the broadcast, at times happy and laughing, at other times moved to tears.
What an incredible guy. For McConnell, the most emotional point came when Anderson remarked that he couldn't believe all the attention, that he was not that important. Oh, God, don't say that. It's just so good to see him free. It just doesn't seem important about anything else. The focus now shifts back to Batavia and when Terry Anderson will be coming back here. Oddly enough, the committee formed to free Anderson is now working on a big homecoming parade. When that happens, organizers say it's going to be the proudest day this community has ever seen. Reporting from Batavia, David Biggie, News Team 10. Since we don't know how long it will be before Terry Anderson visits our area, many people are videotaping welcome home messages to mail to him. The second graders are from Northwood Elementary School in Hilton. They taped their message at the Liberty Pole. Radio station WVOR is sponsoring the program. You can tape a message at Eastview Mall tonight until 9. There will also be a camera at the Brown Duck Tree Farm in Fairport on Sunday afternoon. Congresswoman Louis Slaughter is among the scores of Americans who watched Anderson this morning at his first news conference as a free man. Slaughter says she's extremely impressed with the former hostage's physical appearance, his mental state, and his sense of humor. But she warned that Americans should not hold Anderson to any of his statements just yet. I rejoice right now, first, that he's home with his family, and second, that his health seems to be so good, and his mind is so good and his sense of humor is intact. Right now, I'm grateful for that. I don't want to hold him to anything that he says or doesn't say or, or try to over-critique it. I think that's not fair. I think let's just all be glad that he's back. Slaughter agrees with Anderson that now is the time to look forward, not holding grudges over what has happened in the past. In other news, police and the FBI say they need your help in...